beautiful historic building on the University of Iowa campus. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, Tracy, thank you for setting this all up. And thank you all for coming. It's just, a, it's wonderful to see such a huge crowd, including the people that are out in the halls, um, to attend this event. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Citizens United and the new politics of campaign finance. And this slide is to remind me that I have to give an overview. <laughs> I'm not going forever. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what I refer to as the old new politics of campaign finance. Then I'll talk about Citizens United and SpeakNow.org, uh, both cases against the Federal Election Commission. Then I'll talk about the new new politics of campaign finance. So, the old new politics of campaign finance. Uh, it begins with what it is. You may recall, a little over four decades ago, uh, the committee to re-elect President Richard Nixon broke into Democratic National Headquarters in the Warner Gate Complex. Uh, we start there because uh, the break-in was funded by large, undisclosed contributions from wealthy in uh, interests, and it gave rise to the Federal Election Campaign Act, our nation's first comprehensive campaign finance before the national level. Um, what did the law do? Well, first, we learned that money, it, it made it so that money spent in federal elections had to originate as limited voluntary contributions from U.S. citizens. It placed a disclosure on significant transactions greater than equal to $200. It created an enforcement agency, the Federal Election Commission, uh, the one which now people are very critical of. And it created a public funding option for presidential candidates. So I guess I tried to get rid of this kind of thing. It also uh, helped uh, establish and support some dynamics of fundraising. Uh, candidates would initially get some support, a little bit of money. They would use that to build an organization and do some advertising. Uh, we all get to see that here in Iowa. I never see it in Connecticut. It's great to see PBS. And if successful, um, that advertising would bring public support, more money, and there was a cycle. And the key point, fundraising is linked to public support. The demise of the, new, uh, the, new, of the old new politics, court cases, amendments to the Federal Election Campaign Act, regulatory decision-making, and the creative creation and finding of loopholes. They gave rise to soft money, which is money raised outside the regulated system, in amounts and from sources prohibited to federal candidates, and issue advocacy acts, which were outside spending that didn't call for the election or defeat of the candidate, but was designed to affect elections. Uh, the other side of presidential candidates uh, routinely reject public funds. Congress tried to deal with this through the bipartisan campaign reform act of 2002. Uh, they curbed, uh, eliminated party soft money, curbed soft money, and issue ads for just groups. It had little success, limited success. There were loopholes and challenges. And one of them came from a group called Citizens United. And that challenge went to the Supreme Court. A little background. So Citizens United sought to air this movie called Hillary the Movie, movie and advertise it. And uh, the issue was it was funded with some money. They viewed it as a TV ad or as a TV show, a movie, and the Federal Election Commission said, oh, this is independent spending with some money. We don't like it. Um, the Supreme Court ruled by the four that the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act's prohibitions against independent spending violate free speech rights, including those of corporations, unions, trade associations, and other incorporated groups. The view, money is speech, and these groups are have the rights to people. Uh, speech now, the work for the Election Commission was a quick follow-up, and basically it said that these groups that now can spend their money, as well as wealthy individuals, on independent expenditures to declare the election or defeat of a candidate, could form committees to do this, called super PACs or independent expenditure-only committees. What did the rulings do? Well, there are now more outside spending groups. There is now more outside spending. Um, <coughs> There's greater influence of wealthy individuals and groups. Uh, some of you may know that as of June 30th of this year, there's about 158 families and corporations they control that spend with or uh, donated 
$176 million in connection with, with the campaign. Uh, the interesting thing uh, about that money is most of it's gone to outside groups. So, <coughs> here's another case, not Supreme Court, but public opinion. Obama versus Alito. The president said, uh, last week the Supreme Court reversed the century law to open the floodgates for special interests to spend without limit in our elections. Justice Alito, you probably saw it on TV, frowning, shaking his head, side to side, mounting, mouthing the words, not true. So here's the new campaign finance system. It does, and it, this is a focus on interest groups. It does not replace the old one, it's overlays. So from the old system, we have traditional political action committees. Uh, these are groups that raise regulated money within the regulations. They can contribute to candidates and parties. They can also make independent expenditures. To that, we have alphabet soup. We have super PACs, 527 committees, uh, 501c or social welfare organizations that are active in politics, and corporations, trade unions, labor associations, excuse me, trade associations, labor unions, and others that spend money on independent expenditures. I'm not going to go into much detail on this, but I think my colleague Dave and will agree So what do these groups look like? Well, we now have a situation where buildings, you know, analogous to buildings that get new rooms and other buildings nearby, you know, architecture, we have an architecture politics. When there's a possibility, some groups create new structures. Here's the League of Conservation Voters, basic 501c4 organization. To the right, we have the LCD Education Fund, which is the group that does research on the environmental records of candidates. Maybe you've heard of the Dirty, Dirty Dozen. They're responsible for that. The LCD Accountability Project, the 501c4, publicizes that research. The LCD Political Action Committee, traditional PAC, gives contributions. The organization below it, Super PAC, uh, collects money from all sorts of sources, unregulated, and makes independent expenditures. The engagement fund raises money to support one of this. And then there are the state and local affiliates. Pretty complicated. But a lot of the same people work for all of these different masses. What did interest group spending look like in 2014? This is a big, uh, I think Bob Beersack will say a little bit about it, the unreported spending activity. PAC contributions, about 42%. PAC independent expenditures, 5%. Electioneering communications, 1%. This is sort of the old world of campaign finance, the, the regulated world. Then we have super PACs, 27%. Uh, there's file OMCs, corporations, and, and unions, independent expenditures, 20%. Then we have single candidate super PACs, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, 4%. And single candidate file OMCs, which that 1%. Key point, about 47, 48% of the money spent in 2014 was by those regulated groups. The rest was spent by these newcomers to the political scene. And if you would look back in the 70s, 80s, early 90s, 100% would have been made by the traditional groups. So there's a lot going on in this thing. The effects of outside spending just come to Iowa. More than $650 million was spent the independent expenditures uh, to uh, try to uh, elect a defeated candidate, uh, electioneering communications of other sorts for the same person, uh, purposes. There are about 18 house races where parties and interest groups outspent both candidates, another 47 where they outspent one candidate. You can include Iowa three on that in that group. Uh, the Senate, there were nine races where the groups outspent the candidates. Uh, including in Iowa. Uh, most of this spending is pretty negative and ugly. Uh, it's difficult for the candidates to anticipate or respond to, so they lose a little control of their message. Voters don't, often don't get balanced information, and this weakens accountability. You might not know really what your candidate stands for or what he or she is trying to say, because this group, money, just floods the airways, comes out and flies in the rest. Okay, single candidate super PACs. This is a very important picture. <laughs> These, uh, and single candidate 501 So I'll talk mostly about the super PACs. These are shadow campaign committees. Um, they exist to advance the career, the election of one politician. Um, they raise 
of funds from sources and in amounts that are prohibited to federal candidates. Now, this oxymoron here, uncoordinated coordination, besides me playing basketball, um, refers to how these groups work. <coughs> They're supposed to not coordinate, but the candidates appear at their events. They're the headliners. They can't raise their fundraising events. They can't ask for the money, but they can leave the room when somebody else does. There are staff ties. Former staff, former strong backers are the people who organize these single candidates to move back some money. And then this issue of messaging. It's illegal for them to talk to each other. But things like this happen. There's a website, not too many people know about it. It says things like, oh yeah, we've got a bunch of ads going up. Here's some film we didn't use. If some group out there wants to use it, go for it. Or the, the micro website may say, that was a great ad that group down, ran down in the southern part of my district. You know, love to see it in the northern part. No direct coordination. Anybody can see it. It's public if you can find it or want to find it. And that's why it's uncool. Now, <clears throat> uh, candidates who compacts and campaign committees this presidential election cycle. Red, super PAC, blue, campaign Red, $103 million for George Bush's super PAC. Blue, $25, $26 million for his official campaign. Hillary Clinton, did I say George Bush Jewish? I'm sorry. Hillary Clinton, <laughs> the both of them. Uh, $77 million in her campaign committee, $20 million in this year. Here's Walker, who we dropped out. Uh, Cruz, here you have a candidate who's very, very close. And here you have Bernie Sanders, who's not a big believer in super PACs, and there's $25,000 in the one associated with him. I don't think he has much to do with it. And $41 million in his campaign. And I, I can go through the list, I'll just Here's an interesting person to say Now, <clears throat> why do these parts look different? Well, they look different because there are different regulations and the money comes from different sources. Unregulated outside sources, some not fully disclosed amounts and sources that these groups can't take. Regulated money originates from individual US citizens making a voluntary contribution. And so it explains. There's one other thing that I need to talk about. The old and new fundraising dynamics. Now this chart was very hard to make. I had to overlay a lot of things on top of each other. But it's basically the old chart with the candidate's support. And I couldn't fit all the candidates on either of these, but I just want to make a statistical point. The correlation between public opinion and candidate committee receipts for official campaign committees is 91%. That's near perfect relationship. Correlation between super PACs and public opinion is non existent. So, one of the things this tells us is about the dynamics. The presidential campaign committees, the official committees, play by the old dynamic. Have initial support, the money, use it to build an organization and advertise, build more public support, more money comes in, the bandwagon effect, there's momentum, the committee votes. <coughs> Hillary Clinton started out as the early frontrunner. She had lots of support, stayed popular, continued to raise money. She has a lot of money here. Fortunes. Candidates like Sanders and Carson, they began this cycle as virtually invisible to most people and most donors. We know they're not that way. We know they were able to use their initial resources to build their popularity, which helped them raise more funds and gain momentum. They also succeeded, both of them, in raising quite a few contributions in amounts of less than $50. So this shows, these two candidates show how it all works. Bush started out as the early Republican establishment leader, did not rise in the polls, still has the elite money, which does not really represent the public, but has had trouble gaining traction uh, as in single digits, and his official campaign account reflects that. Now, Donald Trump, the exec exception to all the rules. <laughs> He's got a very small, maybe modest, official campaign account. He didn't raise any of it. It's all from him. He doesn't have a super PAC. He's a, the candidate who, with a little investment, with a huge personality, and with an ability to tap into an anger of public, uh, 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 public anger and, and distrust, 
has been able to attract a lot of media attention and email leads of uh, the Republicans. I have a sign in five minutes. I'll take the last. So, to conclude, <coughs> Citizens United helped usher in the new politics of campaign finance. It does not completely replace the old one. When it comes to contributions, things are regulated. When it comes to independent spending, things are less regulated. There's new, now more outside spending groups. There's now more outside spending. The new fundraising dynamics do not respond to public opinion, but rather to weak desires. The old dynamics still persist. There's now increased influence of wealthy and well-organized groups in their backers. And uh, one thing I don't have to slide up, and I will say is, we have not returned fully to the pre-war game here, but we may, if possible, if, if, uh, if it may be derailed this trend towards less regulation of money and politics and, uh, by some kind of campaign finance reform, but um, I'm skeptical it will happen. I think there have to be major 